everyone. Um, welcome to PwC's newest Women in Technology Tech Talk, uh, where we highlight a selection of PwC's talented women and hear their perspectives on key issues related to technology. Uh, my name is Allison Heslin. I'm really excited to be here today and moderate this important conversation on climate change risk and its intersection with technology. Uh, today's event is extra special as we are closing out our celebrations of Women's History Month. Uh, so big thank you to everyone uh, who's able to join us today. Uh, this session is a panel discussion amongst a fantastic group of women uh, whom I have the pleasure of working closely with on our climate risk modeling team. Uh, so as an order of events, we'll start, of course, with introductions from the panelists to get a background on each of their impressive career paths and the diverse sets of drivers that got them involved in climate research, after which we'll cover a few questions from me about the ways that the panel leverages technology um, to expand our understanding of climate change and climate change associated risk. Following that conversation, there will be significant time allotted for audience driven discussion. So please add any questions you may have uh, throughout into the Q&A and we'll cover them uh, in the Q&A section. So without further ado, we can dive into the session. Um, a very brief introduction of myself before I turn the mic over to the panel. Uh, as I said, my name is Allison Heslin. I'm a director in PwC's risk modeling services practice on the climate risk team. Uh, I come from I come to PwC from a career in academics as a research scientist modeling climate impacts. Uh, my research studied the consequences that changes in the natural environment have for human systems. So modeling climate change impacts on things like agricultural production, food security, migration patterns, and social conflict, uh, with a particular focus on using satellite imagery and remote sensing technology to improve our understanding of climate impacts in data sparse contexts. So places like active conflict zones or uh, in the immediate aftermath of natural disasters. I currently use that research and methodological background to lead the modeling efforts on our team around physical climate hazards and the impacts that they have on businesses. Um, and I'm joined today by four of my colleagues from the climate risk modeling team who I will have introduced themselves in turn. Um, so I think let's start with Lakshmi Murthy. Uh, Lakshmi is also a director in our group. Uh, she's leading the development of our transition risk modeling capabilities. Lakshmi, could you introduce yourself and tell us how you ended up in your current role? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lakshmi Murthy. I have many years of experience working with data analytics and technologies to solve business problems. I've always been interested in all things data and over the years been in been work, worked on a range of projects involving different aspects of data, be it database programming, data strategy and uh, management or uh, developing uh, analytics models using data science methods. I have a master's in computer science and another master's in business analytics. A few years ago, while working for a global investment bank, I got the opportunity to get into climate tech um, to help develop, uh, build a solution to measure the impact of uh, climate change on business. The topic was so interesting uh, that I, I decided to educate myself further and bring my experience in data science and uh, uh, analytics technology into this space and made a career shift. I am now a director, as Allison mentioned, uh, with PwC's Climate Risk Modeling Group uh, based out of New York. Thanks, Lakshmi. I'm really excited to get your take on our panel questions today, um, given the technological and data-focused perspective that you bring to this group. Uh, next, let's meet Barbara Wortham, who's a manager on the team focused on model development uh, Barbara, could you tell us about your path to becoming a climate scientist? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, 
I'm going to take it back to when I started in college because I started as a civil engineering major and I did that because I was really interested in math and technology, but I found out really quickly that I was not interested in applying these skills as much to the built environment. Instead, I learned that I was really inspired by collecting data and modeling the natural environment, which led me to pursue a PhD in climate change science and where I specifically focused on drought. So from there, I got really involved in climate change tech. And that's because during my studies, I became interested in how we model climate change, the impacts from climate change globally, and how it can impact individuals and stakeholders. Once I realized that this was uh, something that I got really excited about, I sought more and more training in coding and big data. And I really found myself in this team about seven months ago. So I'm relatively new. But now I'm a manager in the model development team, really thinking about how we uh, develop climate change hazards and how that plays out in all of the sort of different types of services that we provide to clients. Thanks, Barbara, for sharing your trajectory into climate science. Um, I think we're all very grateful that you found yourself on this team last year. Um, Next up, we have Maggie Brickner. Maggie is a manager on our team focused on client delivery, which will be a great perspective to have when we're talking through what clients need to start thinking about in terms of climate risk and what considerations need to be taken into account by the, the non-climate scientist stakeholders that, that we engage with at clients. Uh, so Maggie, could you tell the audience a bit about your background and what got you into the climate risk space? Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Maggie Brickner, and I think for me, really growing up in a farming community in Wisconsin and seeing the impacts that weather and climate change have on business, that's like always been a very much part of my awareness. And so in undergrad, I majored in environmental science, and after that, worked for the government in farmland conservation planning, so doing things like prairie plantings or buffer strips to help mitigate the impacts of runoff. And I always really enjoyed working with mapping, geospatial data, and using that to make data visualization to help communicate complex ideas to a really broad um, audience. And after working there for five years, I made these two interests sort of connect um, with the climate risk space during my master's program in environmental science and management at UC Santa Barbara. And for my capstone project um, in that program, I worked with a company to assess their physical climate risk and really came to enjoy working with the data that represented an impact that people could instantly relate to through personal experience, whether it be experiencing an extreme weather event, something like that. And as you said today, I work uh, as a manager on the client facing side of the team um, and I'm based out of San Francisco. Thanks, Maggie. I love how your experience in farming inspired a career in climate, given how, how intricately linked those two are with each other. Um, I think that makes good sense. Uh, so very glad that you are able to join us today. Uh, last but not least, we have Eleanor Middlemas, a relatively new joiner to our team who focuses on both the scientific development side, like Barbara, um, as well as working directly on client engagements, like Maggie. Um, Eleanor, could you tell the audience about your recent path that made your way to our team? Um, yeah, I can tell you about my recent path, but first I just want to mention that um, I my background from climate and my motivation goes back a little bit farther. Um, I grew up in the Appalachian Mountain region of Tennessee, uh, where nature was beautiful, but a lot of people there believed climate change was a hoax. Um, so I was first exposed to and intrigued by climate science while I was a math major in college, and there I became hooked. Um, I loved learning about how humans and other species were so intimately tied to our climate. So I decided to dive into the physical climate research since, you know, coming from a, a math background. And I focused mostly on modeling our Earth's atmosphere. So I ended up getting a PhD and even started a postdoctoral fellowship, but I was left wondering what we could actually do about climate change. So I ended up working at a climate analytics startup as a data scientist. And um, here I loved working around the applications of climate data, um, but I was still left curious about how businesses are affected and what they can actually do about climate change. So that's why I ended up joining PwC's cl climate risk modeling team as a senior associate. So now I do a little bit of both modeling development and client facing work, as Allison said. Um, so I love coding and applying my math skills, but I also love learning about how businesses function and operate and incorporate sustainable action into their operations. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, thanks to the whole panel for sharing your unique stories with the audience. Um, to the audience, as you may have noticed, we've assembled quite the powerhouse of a panel 
in terms of scientific and technical prowess. Uh, and I think that's actually quite representative of the level of expertise on our team as a whole. Um, it's it's uh, pretty great to get to work with such brilliant minds every day. Uh, so with that, we will go into our first question for the panel. Uh, so I was hoping we could start with some definitions and level setting, as I imagine that we have a bit of a range uh, in the audience in terms of familiarity with considering climate risk. So after we set the stage, we can dive into the technology that we use for modeling and communicating climate risk. We'll get into the challenges, the considerations, opportunities related to climate risk modeling. Uh, but wanted to start completely at the foundation uh, to make sure we're all on the same page of what we mean when we say risk, when we say climate risk, um, when we say climate technology. So Lakshmi, could you start um, with an introduction to what we mean when we talk about risk generally uh, and climate risk in particular? And sure, Alison. So risk is anything that could impact your business negatively or even cause it to fail. It is something uh, you should measure uh, assess and track on an ongoing basis. Now, climate risk is a risk assessment based on formal analysis of consequences, likelihoods, and responses to, uh, to the impacts of climate change on your business. It is a understanding of quantifying your financial impact to climate, financial impact of climate-related disruptions on your business. Great, that's helpful grounding for our conversations. Uh, so building from there, when we're thinking about climate risk specifically, we generally divide them into two broad categories, physical risks and transition risks, uh, as well as potential opportunities within those two categories as well. Uh, Barbara, could you talk through physical risk for the audience, which I think is the type of risk that we intuitively tend to associate with climate change? Yeah, absolutely. So physical risk is can be very intuitive, like you said, Allison, because climate change can affect businesses by physically threatening their assets or their supply chains. So assessing the physical threat to a business is is part of that definition of climate change risk that Lakshmi uh, rolled out for us. So you can think of this with an example. Um, hurricanes may get more intense in certain parts of the Atlantic over the next century because they derive their energy from the temperature of the surface ocean. And with warming of the global temperature, the surface ocean will also get warmer. So anyone living along the Atlantic coast can likely attest to crop loss, business interruptions, or damages to their buildings or homes um, in the wake of a big hurricane. So we really want to better understand where the risk of that damage is now um, in our current climate and where it will be in the future. When we understand this, that's what it really means to understand the physical climate change risk. So that's really my definition of um, physical climate change risk. Great. Thanks, Barbara, for covering physical risk. Uh, so the other bucket of transition risk, um, Lakshmi, could you walk us through what we mean when we talk about transition risk? Uh, sure. So, um, as uh, so, besides physical risk, there's another broad category of uh, climate risk called transition risk, which is the risk that arises from changing of strategies, policies, or investments as so as society and industry and and the world itself transitions towards a lower carbon economy. Such transitions would mean that some sectors would be more affected than others. For instance. Uh, if we look at uh, coal, um, coal mining or oil and gas sectors, those are carbon sensitive sectors, carbon intensive sectors. They're, they have a larger transition risk than some others like technology or media. There is a standard for and guidelines for uh, climate related disclosures, uh, which is called the Task Force, of Cli Task Force on Climate-Related uh, Financial Disclosures, or TCFD, that provides a framework on how companies should consider, manage, uh, assess, and disclose risk. Thanks, Lakshmi. Um, maybe we can build on something you just mentioned. You bring up TCFD, which is a voluntary disclosure framework relating to climate risks. And I think this is an important point to cover at the top here, um, not exclusively the TCFD, but more broadly around climate reporting 
uh, and what's motivating many clients to start assessing their climate risk. Uh, Maggie, I'll, I'll pick on you next. You haven't gone yet. Uh, could you give a little context maybe around climate-related disclosures? Yeah, sure. So DCFD is sort of the, the baseline framework for a lot of voluntary and sort of emerging regulatory disclosures um, that sort of outline how companies can assess their physical and um, transition climate risks as well as climate-related opportunities. And so that's a key piece of work that um, our team helps clients, clients with doing that um, risk and opportunity assessment. And from there, these disclosures also recommend conducting quantitative scenario analysis. So since we can't predict the, the climate future, this is assessing the potential financial impact of these risks or opportunities under multiple projections of possible climate futures or climate scenarios. So this scenario analysis is another key piece of work that our team does. Um, and I think important to emphasize here too, that in addition to just fulfilling like disclosures, reporting um, requirements, companies uh, can also use our work um, to consider how climate risk might relate to things like their net zero strategy, overall emissions management, or just um, overall risk management as a whole. Um, something else that I think is key to mention here is that while so far in the US, this um, climate risk work has been voluntary. In March, 2022, the SEC released a proposed rule that would require companies to disclose qualitative and quantitative climate related information. Um, now this has not yet been finalized, but as the draft ru rule was written, um, larger accelerated filers could be required to report as soon as fiscal year 2023. So that'd be filing in 2024. So just an example of how this is not a distant issue and is something that our clients are already very much thinking about and that we're, we're helping them to think about. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, everyone. That's, that's a really helpful start, I think, to take such a big concept like climate risk and break it down into some component pieces like physical and transition risk, uh, but also to consider the motivations for companies to start assessing these risks. I think these considerations are important to have in mind as we go through the remainder of our discussion. So now that we know what we mean when we say climate risk, we can add in the technology component uh, with our next question that I'll probably look to Barbara and Eleanor to speak to, given that they both work quite hands-on in climate modeling. Uh, and that is very simply, what is climate technology? Uh, maybe Barbara, could you start by speaking to the types of climate technology that you've used in your work? Yeah, absolutely. So really for me, when we're talking about climate technology or, or the concept of climate technology, it really starts with the global climate models. So these are models that are based on our physical understanding of how the earth works. They are created by first defining that system as a series of equations. And then we stress that system by adding CO2 to sort of mimic the different scenarios as Maggie was talking about. These global climate models are created by major government agencies across the world. And then we compare these different climate models as the different agencies have made them to really understand the opportunities and also the differences between how we've uh, defined the Earth system and each of these different kinds of models. Um, in my work, I really utilize um, the outputs of these models, which are essentially global data sets of physical parameters. So you might think of temperature or precipitation change that is coming out of these global climate models. And we feed that in our team at PwC into what we call peril models, which is a model that basically defines something like a hurricane or a drought, perils that might uh, occur more or less because of climate change. And we develop those um, in-house at PwC, like I said. So these peril models eventually define globally relevant layers um, of climate change risk. And this is really how I define climate change technology um, in this work. Thanks, Barbara. Eleanor, do you have anything to add to that from your work using climate models? Yeah, um, so I think of climate technology as the use of any climate related data in combination with mathematical or dynamical modeling to address climate risk. So for example, as Barbara said, we could be utilizing dynamical global climate models, but another example could be building a statistical or machine learning model that predicts flooding at a client's asset locations. Or as an example of transition risk, 
Uh, climate technology could be building a model that predicts future energy prices under different policy scenarios given a client's historical energy consumption. So in both of these examples, we're taking data, whether from existing weather forecasts, climate projections, or client-provided data, and we apply some analysis or additional modeling to result in an assessment of climate-related risk. Those are some examples of how I've used various kinds of climate technologies in addition to global climate models and illustrates generally how I think about climate technology. Thanks, Eleanor and Barbara, for sharing those examples. I think it makes it more tangible for the audience to know what we're actually referring to um, when we discuss climate tech today. So we've covered what risk means uh, and what sorts of, at a high level, complex technical modeling processes go into these risk models. Um, so now I wanna think about this in terms of our clients. So what sort of things do clients need to be considering regarding technology and data related to climate change? Um, we'll start with Maggie on this one as you have a lot of client facing exposure. Yeah, sure. So I think something that's important to emphasize here is that for clients, truly understanding the quantity of data can be a challenge. Um, and then further distilling that into financial impacts um, to a single business can, can be a huge challenge too. So um, just from a very basic perspective, as, a, as an example, um, take the physical risk side. So say in a scenario analysis, you're considering seven different perils. So things like hail, hurricane, flood, sea level rise, and you're looking at that under two to three of the different climate scenarios that Barbara was talking about and projecting that out until 2050 or, or 2100. Um, and then when you expand that out across the company's full real estate portfolio, that can be a lot of information even for someone who's very invested in scenario analysis and climate risk assessment um, for anyone to process. And now if you expand that even further into transition risks or out into the supply chain and different categories of greenhouse gas emissions, the amount of data can expand really quickly. And this ultimately needs to be distilled down probably into a couple um, paragraphs of disclosure in the end. Um, I don't know, maybe Eleanor, you could provide a bit more background on what you see on the climate scenario modeling side and how big data plays into that before we even get the, the data to the clients. Yeah, um, that's a really good thought exercise, Maggie, whenever you're describing kind of the, the dimensionality of the data. I kind of want to focus on that a little bit more and, and explain why physical climate risk, risk data is considered big data. Um, to start, it's huge. Uh, we take climate change projections from various institutions across the globe that build their own climate models. So, for example, many national atmospheric or weather laboratories have their own climate models. And each of these institutions' model projections have many dimensions. Maggie already described some of them, but just to give you some more uh, clarification, you can think of, you know, one time step has space with like many different perils. You can think of like a map and then the weather happening above it. Then you project that into time. And then there are many different futures or scenarios as we've been alluding to before. So on top of each of these scenarios having many different hazards, we just end up having a ton of physical climate risk data. So it's important for us to work with clients to narrow the focus of their potential, potential physical risk so that we can reduce that dimensionality of the data and deliver a compelling story. Our team can do this if the client provides some inventory or coordinates of where their physical assets are located to start. So we can then cross-check those asset locations with physical climate hazards using a solution developed by our team called geospatial climate intelligence. Geospatial climate intelligence incorporates geospatial maps, time series, bar charts, to visualize high dimensional data on top of those clients' asset locations. Our interface helps clients identify the most pertinent perils, areas, scenarios, or time horizons according to those asset locations. Once we choose those most impactful hazard dimensions, our team can then build detailed models of the projected financial consequences due to those particular physical hazards. The geospatial climate intelligence is just one example of the climate technology that our team uses, as Barbara and I have been describing earlier, in combination with that client-provided data to develop climate risk solutions. But either way, our analysis is dependent on that client data. Thanks, Eleanor. I really appreciate you both walking us through the considerations for clients when it comes to data uh, and also showing an example of how 
we at PwC use technology to communicate climate risk with our clients. Uh, so I'd like to take a closer look at something that feels like it's right under the surface of Maggie and Eleanor's answers about considerations when modeling risk, and that is the challenges that modeling climate risk can pose to clients. Uh, so I'd like to start with Lakshmi and Maggie on this one. Can you talk about some of the challenges that clients face organizationally when approaching climate risk modeling? So I think many organizations are new to considering climate risk. They struggle in not knowing where to start, how to model, what to measure, and how to integrate climate risk into their overall risk management framework. Now, as uh, Maggie mentioned before, data collection is a big challenge. Huge amounts of data, it's a time-consuming manual process sometimes, and uh, there can be lack of reliable, accurate data, climate data. It comes in the form of estimates and proxies and industry averages. Uh, there is no standardized form, so that can be a challenge. And I would say also lack of talent, lack of uh, in-house resources may be uh, another challenge. Uh, carbon measurement and climate risk modeling requires very specific technical specializations, and not many organizations might find that talent in-house. So they may find it more efficient to partner with uh, vendor uh, solutions like the ones that PwC provides, offers, and integrate that into their, uh, uh, into their internal systems rather than develop these uh, climate risk models right from scratch. Yeah, I think just to add to that too, from a, from a client perspective, this is in many ways a totally new exercise. So climate risk management and modeling, it's bringing together teams that haven't traditionally work together in the past maybe, um, and data that is either just now beginning to be collected internally or might exist within other teams, but um, the ones who are managing climate risk might not have sight into it or its maintenance. Um, additionally, I think another, another thing that can be challenging is that climate risk takes into consideration longer time horizons. So I mentioned like 2050, 2100. Um, and those are much longer than sort of the two to three years that are typically considered in like internal ERM or like corporate strategy. Um, so it's thinking about how to incorporate all those challenges um, into existing practices. Right, that makes sense. Thanks. It's not a not a perfectly clean fit into existing structures and ways of thinking um, for certain industries that haven't thus far had to develop internal expertise or processes around estimating environmental impacts on their business. Uh, so now I want to pass the same question over to the climate specialists on the call, Barbara and Eleanor. Uh, could you guys talk about some scientific challenges that come with climate risk modeling? Barbara, could you start um, talking about working with physical climate risk models? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, the challenges that Lakshmi and Maggie brought up and that you summarized, Allison, are, are very real. And then on the other coin, the other side of that coin really is the scientific challenges. So there are a lot of challenges to, to climate risk modeling. And unfortunately, really, um, the big problem is that we don't have a crystal ball and we can't see into the future. Um, and furthermore, our understanding of how the Earth system works is not totally perfect. You know, we're we're working on that still. So we can take steps to overcome these imperfections in our understanding, but it remains a really big challenge. We want to make sure that we are not only providing really the leading science to our clients, which I know that our team takes very, very, very seriously, but also we really need to underline when there are limitations to what the science can tell us. Um, these are really the challenges that I see, but Eleanor, what do you think? Yeah, I basically second Barbara's comment and the other things that have been said so far, um, but how I think of it is modeling changes in the earth system and responses to potential policy changes is extremely sophisticated. And sometimes we have to perform a brand new analysis in order to fulfill client needs. So this could be exciting for our team, but it poses a challenge. Um, we have to balance client needs, industry-leading science, as Barbara said, and uncertainties in our models or input data. For the client, this means we should confirm that we can still distill impactful take-home messages clearly while honoring scientific uncertainty. So the novelty of it all just makes it really challenging. Thanks all for adding 
nuances of all the things to consider when working uh, to project and estimate risks in the future. So now we have an exciting question, which I'm sure everyone on the panel has their own enthusiastic answer to, uh, because we're going to talk about our work at PwC. Uh, but I'd like to hear what the panel thinks makes us unique in terms of our ability to deliver climate tech solutions to our clients. Yeah, actually, I think I can take this one since I have um, experience in a different part of the climate tech sector. So I think PwC is helping to fill industry needs. Um, as Lakshmi mentioned before, clients may have a hard time knowing exactly how to use climate technology. Plus, responding to climate change requires more than a one-size-fits-all solution. So instead of simply handing over a package of climate risk data to the client, PwC helps clients understand the data. Plus, we offer personalized advisory services to the client on their physical and transition risks and assist them in forming adaptation plans and mitigation strategies in the face of climate change. But Maggie, actually, I'm curious about what you think since I've worked with you on some uh, client projects. Yeah, thanks, Eleanor. So I think just to add to that, as climate risk becomes more regulated, whether in the U.S. or internationally, I think PwC is very well positioned to be a leader in the space, both with our assurance routes. And then, as you can see from the people on this call, um, our investments in climate science and low carbon economy transition. Um, it's a really exciting team to be on um, and an exciting space to be in right now. Um, maybe, Lakshmi, we haven't heard as much about the um, climate-related solutions and services. You could add a little bit on that. Um, so we have a suite of uh, solutions to measure the impact of climate change, right? Like starting from physical and transition risks, which we already spoke about. There's also quantification of greenhouse gases. There's decarbonizing and target setting tools. Uh, our sophisticated climate risk models are backed with huge amounts of climate and earth data integrated with organizations, financial and non-financial data. So, and uh, we have visualizations that highlight climate change facts and um, projected risks and opportunities and uh, help the client understand their exposure to uh, climate change. So we are constantly innovating and have multiple product offerings and advisory services that would help clients in their net zero journey and compliance requirements. Thanks, everyone. Those are all really great answers. I would add, though I know I'm not supposed to be giving answers, I'm moderating. Um, but just to reiterate my comment at the beginning of the panel, I think that our in-house climate science expertise is phenomenal. Uh, and that makes us very unique in terms of our offerings because we can provide highly sophisticated models and metrics um, that are tailored to specific clients because we have climate modelers working on the projects um, as opposed to you know, being constrained by third-party data that is fixed in its form um, and then fixed in what you can do with it. Um, so yeah, sorry, I know I'm not supposed to answer, but I couldn't help myself on that one um, because I am excited about our team. So with that, we arrived at the final question of the panel section. Um, so I'll just pause to remind everyone if you have questions that you want us to cover in the Q&A after we finish this question, uh, just go ahead and drop them in the Q&A box right now so that we can make sure uh, that we get to them um, as soon as we're done. Uh, we're gonna try to get through as many as possible uh, until we run out of time. Uh, so for the final question, which is building a bit off of the last one, uh, what is next in terms of climate offerings? Lakshmi, can you start us off with this? Sure. I would say we would continue to be a, being a leader in climate tech, providing industry thought leadership and expanding on PwC's suite of innovative digital solutions and advisory services to help clients in their ESG and climate strategy. I would say also a big focus would be on measurement of other environmental risks and opportunities like nature and biodiversity. Yeah, that would I, be the I next would big thing. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Lakshmi. <laughs> no, but no I really wanted to second what you were saying and also say that really for me, the most exciting thing about this moment is that it feels like PwC has the opportunity to set a standard in how this technology should work. 
Um, those standards for us focus on how open and available the developers should be in answering questions and developing unique solutions, as Allison brought up in her answer uh, to the last question. In our team, we really call it a no block black box solution, meaning that we're really transparent about how we get uh, from data inputs to the recommendations. So finally, we have the opportunity to show that technology, science, and really big data should be leading us in this decision making around climate change. And although climate change should be taken very seriously and can be scary, we really do have uh, the tools to make the solutions accessible in this team. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, and to the whole panel for your thoughtful engagement with the questions so far.